presentation I put together called the unintentional findings of the honey badger. Am I coming through a little hot or pretty good? Awesome. Lovely. So this talk is actually dedicated to my mom. You'll find out why. I can't really thank her enough for her influence and everything. Um, and I do want to just warn all of you, this slide deck is full of cute children and beautiful pictures of Asheville that I did not take. All right, so where do we start? First, we start at the beginning, right? My brother and I grew up and we were extremely well taken care of, totally loved, wonderful family, except the fact that my father has MS. And due to his health, my mom routinely needed to take on a lot. Um, always was doing way more extra above and beyond. She had multiple jobs. She went to grad school. She worked at the same time. But she still always made it home to cook dinner, give us baths, give us a big hug, and make sure we made it to bed. What she did afterwards, I can't imagine. But she instilled a sense of compassion, hard work, dedication, and commitment from the minute that we were born. My mom helped my brother and I the whole way through college. She helped pay for it. She came down and took us to dinner, all of this other stuff. She was amazing. Uh, during that time, I learned a program. And I started to solve some new and different problems and acquire skills that I had never had before. Pretty fun. I met some of my first uh, mentors <laughs> uh, that I now am still friends with to this day and hang out with on a routine basis. And uh, I did meet, I met my beautiful wife, Jamie. We got married during this time, right after college. And uh, I uh, decided then to go to work. So um, after a brief stint in private industry doing some consulting, I actually went to Penn State University. And I went to grad school. I taught and I worked full time. That I would not recommend that any individual tries to do. But the apple does not far fall, uh, does not fall far from the tree, right? My mom did the exact same thing. After about eight years at Penn State, I was really trying to seek some new growth and new opportunities. I kind of felt like I was. You know, I'd been there a while and I needed to mix things up. I got my master's degree in information security. And at that time, I actually ended up teaching four different computer science classes while I was there. But life was too comfortable for me. I was ready to mix it up a bit. So I needed something new. During my time at Penn State, I had learned Drupal. And I had evolved from what I would traditionally call just a programmer to someone that was capable of solving some larger problems and using the tool the right way and sort of expanding a bit more beyond just raw code. So I decided to leave and I went to Acquia. My personal life was growing as well. I felt a little bit more purpose now, it's a little deeper, uh, a little bit more responsibility. And it sort of hit me one day that I decided I really need to make sure that I was trying to make the world a better place for my kids. I wanted them to be thriving and have a good place to live. Uh, but while working at Acquia, I also had a little bit less time and some more obligations that I wasn't accustomed to at Penn State. Uh, so it was a little bit awkward. So even with all of my hard work, and my care and compassion for my customers and everything that I dedicated myself to Acquia, I actually failed. I failed hard. Success is most often achieved by those who don't know that failure is inevitable. I had a really hard time juggling my personal priorities. I want to spend time with my kids and, and, and everything like that but also honoring those at work. The clients were very demanding, uh, but my wife and kids needed me, and it was very hard. It was a struggle. 
So even though I cared about my job and the customers, and I did exactly what I'm used to doing, which is dedicating myself and, and investing in work and everything, uh, it was just extremely challenging. My strengths were not working. And I didn't realize that for me to really succeed, I needed to fail. But before I learned that, when I left Acquia, I felt like damaged goods. What was I, what was I doing? Had I made the wrong choices? Was I in the wrong career? Why, why didn't this work? Because every single day, I did the things that I knew to do, that I was confident about, that I was, all, all of the hard work and dedication that I think is my strength. So what went wrong? I had a lot of doubts. So I was uncertain of my choices, and I wasn't sure what the future would hold. And then I made it to Civic Actions. Dan did a great job of introducing the points uh, of civic actions around priority and balance, but I have to, I'm not gonna lie to you, I really felt like they took on a project by hiring me. Uh, I probably was, at that point, the least balanced person that ever walked in their door. Uh, civic actions has an established good culture. Uh, they promote work-life balance at every single point, every opportunity they can, and they really care about doing good in the world, and that's something that, um, that I always wanted to do, and I believe in, and I aspire to be. It really is around working with some level of purpose, but also living life in a friendly way, right? But I felt really far removed from this. <laughs> so I felt it was, to me, a bit of a stretch, you know, joining the team, and, and uh, I didn't actually realize how difficult <laughs> it would be for me to transition in doing this. As part of that transition, I ended up being asked by the CEO, uh, who I work with on a routine basis, to read a book. Uh, the book is called The Last Word on Power, and it talks about uh, a couple different things that are some themes of this talk that I think are going to be helpful to steer this conversation. The first thing that I learned um, in the first chapter of the book, really, is it talks a lot about how our brains are conditioned. And every experience that we have have conditioned our brain a certain way to make, uh, to see life the way that we see it, specifically through our lens. And every single experience that we have shapes that lens that we see our life through. The last word on power introduces the idea called a winning strategy. And a winning strategy is based on this conditioning. So this forms our reality and it shapes the way that we see the world in a subconscious way. Chances are you are not even aware of your own winning strategy. So each one of us does have a winning strategy, and that reflects, is a reflection of our life and life's experiences. But, to quote the book, this winning strategy is both the reason for your current success and your biggest limitation to move forward. Let that sink in for a second. To see what is in front of one's nose is a constant struggle. And that was by George Orwell. So our winning strategy is truly a formation of what it is that has worked for us in our lives and has made us comfortable. Our brain seeks comfortable. We don't like the uncomfortable. So our brain is conditioned to basically use our winning strategies. And we're not even aware of our existence of it because it is subconscious. We do it naturally. So because it influences the way that we see the world, our entire perspective in life is biased around our winning strategies. So as technologists, we look at things, the word programming, uh, with a, a certain meaning. And that uh, word usually is around the code, right? Uh, so, hey, we're going to go program a website, 
going to drop in some PHP, a little bit of CSS. But uh, if you look at your brain, you can almost look at it the same way. If you look at your life's experiences, and we talk about our conditioning and our predisposition, that is, in some respect, a level of programming. And that is really what influences the bias, biases that we see in this world. So our experiences in winning strategy really help to shape what we perceive as good or bad, right or wrong, and most importantly, possible or not possible. Sadly for me, my winning strategy is that of a honey badger. I work very hard. I vigorously pursue the endeavors with a level of focus that I think is pretty, pretty spot on. I have a tireless drive. I work hard. I work late at night. And I keep going until the job gets done. My inner honey badger helps me deliver. I dive into anything, and I get crap done. There it is. And I don't let anyone or anything get in my way. If I deliver, nothing bad can happen to me. Right? My honey badger is just a way to hide my own vulnerabilities. As a honey badger, I want the world to see exactly what is in this awesome photoshopped image that I made for myself one time and posted to Facebook. I want someone to see the world, or see me, uh, as someone who delivers, someone who's strong, capable, and technically brilliant. And I have spent my entire career trying to avoid my own vulnerabilities. I recognize now that I cannot reach my fullest potential without embracing it. So I have deep-seated fears based on how I grew up that somehow, if I don't work hard, that my own livelihood would be threatened. And this was never present to me until I learned about it recently. Hard work, dedication, focus, and problem solving is my winning strategy intended for me to overcome my own deep-seated fears. I would be forever successful if I did this. But my winning strategy has already failed me. I rarely consider <laughs> the social repercussions of a honey badger, especially in the workplace. And I shouldn't say rarely, maybe, maybe I'm not giving myself enough credit. But a honey badger can really come off extremely insensitive, uh, especially when the goals and the things that I'm trying to pursue involve other people. I'm too focused on getting crap done. And people can impede my progress. They can challenge my ideas. They can slow things down if there isn't consensus. So what I see sometimes is people can really threaten my winning strategy. This actually conflicts with my true motivations and my true passion in life because I actually, I deeply care about people. And I deeply care about solving problems that are important to people. Talk about a weird thing, right? Yeah, that's me. So now that we've identified the problem, how is it that we move forward? And everything that I'm going to talk about moving uh, in the rest of the talk here is about learning to act with a new level of purpose. So to grow, we must seek to evolve beyond our winning strategy. We must understand what it, our winning strategy is and learn how to use it effectively. Have you ever tried or attempted to really deeply understand and analyze yourself? This is not a fun exercise <laughs> whatsoever. Have you ever paid attention to your patterns and your preferences and your tendencies, just speaking to other people or how you react in a meeting or what you write about or how you spend your time? Have you ever done that? 
It is ridiculously hard, (laughs) but it is extremely eye-opening. And the only way that we can evolve is for us to be able to recognize these exact tendencies. So as we noted, or as I noted, you really need to deeply reflect about yourself. So put on your thinking cap, throw your nerdy glasses on, and dig your heels in and get to work, right? You need to be able, uh, you need to be capable of recognizing your winning strategy when you use it. And I would actually say that it's not just about what you're doing right now. You should actually carve out some time on a routine basis to afford a level of focus and reflect on your life. That's a good thing to do. Have you defined your priorities? Are you honoring those priorities? And you probably will say no, but don't beat yourself up too much because you have the rest of your life to fix it. There is hope. I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything as if it were a nail. I love that quote. Abraham Maslow. So we must learn to only use our winning strategy when it is the correct strategy to win. We cannot use it all the time like we are inclined to do and how we're programmed and how we're wired. And in everyday life, even subtle triggers will bring out this winning strategy. So you need to be aware of it. And to grow, you must learn to transcend that winning strategy because not everything is a nail. So how do we do that? To recognize when to use it, you need to be present. This is your words, your actions, your entire state of being. This is self-awareness, something that I clearly struggled with for quite some time. Presence is a tool to help look and analyze any situation and recognize how you should be responding to it. We need to be aware of our state of being. The real challenge is the actual discipline to do that. It's it's easy to do it in a given moment or a certain isolated uh, instance in time. It's substantially harder to do it all the time. I would actually challenge you to be present. You need to pause and always make sure you're responding in a way that may not be natural to the way that you think you should respond to something. Then is then, now is now. And we must grow to learn the difference. So to be self-aware, we need to reflect on our lives. We talked about that a little bit. Our winning strategies are formed from the past. Everything that we have done and all the experience that we have is where we came from. But yet, this is exactly what shapes our bias moving forward into the future. People like me often will sit back and wait for the right opportunity or the right direction to point us where we need to go in life. We're going to wait for it. But guess what? There is no time like right now. Every day you wake up, you're given a chance to move further towards your goals. You have a clean slate, a fresh beginning. Your head rises from the pillow, right? What are you going to do with it? How are you going to take advantage of that opportunity? So how do we reprogram our brains a bit. You are capable of doing so. I think the key is you need to be motivated to do so. Think of when you learned a program. It was really hard, right? You're tripping up over function names and semicolons and you're misspelling things and you weren't doing the right formatting and people were yelling at you left and right when you were doing code reviews. But you stuck with it because you knew it would get you to a goal. Maybe it was a new job or some new skill that you wanted. 
You trained your brain through repeated action, repeated practice. You kept with it. And with every single attempt that you did, you learned, and programming became less of a struggle and more of a skill. So, what is my reprogramming? What does that look like for me? I need to recognize what my triggers are and act with more purpose. I cannot just think that if I go through in life and be a honey badger all the time, that that's going to work for everybody. Probably not. Repetitive change towards my traditional hardwired responses is what is required for me to overcome this. And gradually, hopefully over time, I will keep the honey badger at bay, and this new way of being will become second nature to me. So I love this uh, graphic uh, promoting empathy. This is like the typical code review, uh, the only valid measurement of code quality, WTFs per minute, right? Totally hilarious. Um, and uh, yeah, been there. So. For me, um, I, I think one of the keys about promoting empathy is really around patience <laughs> and practicing it on a routine basis. Um, I really want to try to embrace that as a philosophy, and I would encourage all of you to do that as well. We, we are all in some state of learning in our lives. I think sometimes we, as uh, normal you know, human beings and technologists, are a little bit competitive. Uh, but we're all learning things. And so for us to really promote empathy and to be sensitive of other people and, and where they are in their life's journey, um, we need to make sure that we are supporting them on that. And this is clearly an example of, of not doing that. We should not be reviewing code and cursing people out. Um, but I need to be training my brain to be promoting empathy on a more routine basis and not let my inner honey badger take over or feel threatened. Imagine what you are capable of doing in life if you're not doing this. If you're bringing people with you on your journey instead of shutting them out and swearing at them whenever they submit code. That's a big difference, right? Um, so you can do more if you bring others with you in life. And I think that's incredibly important. So make sure that you're always promoting and making demands of being emotionally intelligent because there's way more to life than just having technical skill. Once you take fear out of the equation, the what ifs and maybes disappear and you go forth boldly from a place of love and courage. And that was written by Wendy Carrillo. So for me to do so, I need to have an awareness of what I fear and not be afraid of failure for me or other people. Failure is critical. It presents the biggest, the single most opportunity for us to grow as individuals. What are you afraid of? Have you asked yourself that question? Do you understand what you're afraid of in life? Your fear will prevent you from achieving the goals that you are meant to achieve on this planet. So let's spend a minute on goals. Right, what you're seeing here is Rocky Mountain National Park. This is in Estes Park, Colorado. Uh, I visited there last year. It was a really beautiful place. And uh, you probably were expecting Asheville, but sorry, I just really like this picture. Uh, <laughs> so let's, let's view our goals as a peak, just for one minute. A peak on a mountain. We all want to get to that peak. And our general, our natural tendency and response is to look at that and say, I have a path to get to this peak. What happens if you encounter, uh, encounter a boulder that is in your path? You can't get around it. Well, what do you do? Well, you have to seek a different path to get to the peak, right? It's a big mountain. You can find something else. And the same analogy applies to your winning strategy. You will probably not be able to reach your peak with your winning strategy alone. You need to identify other strategies 
when yours does not work. You need to be able to find a second route. Life is journey and not a destination. This might be also a lyric from uh, an Aerosmith song, maybe, but uh, the author is Ralph Waldo Emerson. We are all in some state of that journey. We are all in some part of that path towards our peak. We're somewhere in the middle, right? But what I'm gonna tell you is life itself is the journey. It's not simply a peak on a mountain that is being climbed. Imagine what opportunities that you are missing if you focus on that peak. What is it that you aren't seeing if you can't, if you're just totally laser focused on something? So I'm gonna challenge you to see opportunity in everyday life. We often dismiss opportunities if we cannot see how it gets us to our peak. We dismiss them. What if we took opportunities of what life handed us? They may offer unconventional paths, but you may reach a peak. You may reach a different peak, you may reach a peak that you wanted to. Ignoring life's opportunities means that we may never actually get to the peak that we want and that we may never achieve. Only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. And that was by Robert F. Kennedy. So what I'm telling you today is basically to try to move past your winning strategy. Ignore it, if you will. Take risks because your bias and your perspective is telling you not to. Suppose you take an opportunity that is presented to you. What's the worst that can happen? Would you fail? And if you fail, do you think that you learned something? I think so. But maybe you won't fail. And maybe you'll cure cancer. Maybe you will do something so substantial in this world that you will be a hero or looked up to. You can do that. But you can never achieve anything great without having the courage to move beyond where you are right now, to take those risks and avoid your winning strategy. The right perspective makes the impossible possible. So if you look beyond your winning strategy, you can do incredible things. <laughs> you see the world through a new lens, and it's not one that's constrained by good or bad, uh, right or wrong, or possible or impossible. So I'm going to challenge you to do that. So if you're capable of failing in anything that you do, wouldn't you want to invest towards something that brings you energy? Something that drives you? This picture right here is a picture of me two weeks ago. I ran my first 5K of my entire life. I didn't think I was going to be able to do that. I didn't stop once. I chugged right along. I did it. And I showed you the guns. <laughs> so, what brings you energy? Have you thought about that? You should. You should identify what brings you energy, and you should dedicate yourself and your life and your life's work towards that. If you have no drive and no energy, you will give up when it gets hard. You will not solve the impossible. You'll just quit because you don't care about it. So invest your time into what is important to you. And if you fail, you are at least learning about the things that you are passionate about. And that alone is a gift. 
I love this picture, by the way. That was my first, uh, first child uh, when she was really super tiny. Uh, so our reality, if you think about it, is really something that sets constraints of the world. I hear things all the time. People will say things like, I don't have enough money, or I'm too busy at work. And those are constraints, right? But let's pause for a moment and think about, let's say you go to the doctor and someone tells you that you only have three months to live. Let's use that as a scenario. So are you going to be worried about closing out tickets for a client or programming this thing that you're doing right now today? Heck no. Absolutely not. You now have a true and a pure sense of urgency to, uh, to pursue what your life's priorities are. You are free from constraint. So why do we not do that now? What would happen if you did that today? I think that's a valid question because you are not promised tomorrow. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder that I work, the more that I live. And that's George Bernard Shaw. Life is too short. It really is. So we need to look at each moment as a way to invest towards our future and what it is that we want to do on this earth. You need to dedicate yourself and work hard to achieve everything that you are capable of and live without any sort of regret. And like my honey badger, I'm going to challenge you to vigorously pursue your goals, work hard to achieve them, and make sure that you are keeping your life's purpose as something that is very present to you in your life. You may get hit by a bus walking across the street, so you should have some sense of urgency to make sure that you are doing what it is that you are here to do as soon as you feel comfortable doing so. So I want to summarize what we talked about a bit, or what I talked about. Uh, definitely promote self-awareness. Condition your brain to move beyond just your winning strategy. Take risks. Learn. Be more opportunistic. Do not get stuck on one path in life. Honor your priorities. Free yourself from constraints and have a sense of urgency to get where you want to be. So for me, to rid myself of this lovely honey badger, uh, I'm going to read you a quote from Rachel Andrews. She actually tweeted this. Um, Seems like there is enough miserable stuff happening in the world without us being nasty to folks in our own industry. We can be better. I want to thank you all. This is an incredible opportunity for me, uh, something that was absolutely a goal of mine. Uh, I did what I didn't think was possible <laughs> by doing this talk and presenting it for all of you. I want to thank all of the organizers who are totally amazing and incredible. This is a lovely camp, uh, and thank you very much.